everyone wants to be the best world builder that they can be. Now, with these simple tips, you can be too. Hello and welcome everybody to the Crit Academy. I am your host, Justin. I'm your guest, Garvin. And I'm Lost your guest, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> we hope to inspire you with creative content that you can bring with your next Bring with you on your next adventure. All right. I am super excited for today's main topic. Um, the the website CBR put out an amazing 10 Dungeons & Dragons world building tips. We're going to talk a little bit about it, and we're going to add our own little two copper to the, the topic. So if you've wanted to know how to bring your content to life, your world to life, make it feel fresh and entertaining to everyone involved, then you're at the right episode. We want to thank uh, our, our pal uh, uh, Garwin, our Emerald patron, for joining us again, sitting in no for problem. Brandon, who is in fact not here today um, because it's a past holiday and he had things to do. So, yeah, should we just dive right into it? Dive right in. So, now these are not in any particular order, so one isn't necessarily better than ten. They're all great mm -hmm. tips. The very first tip that they give us is diversity of location. Holy okay. crap! I cannot agree with this more mm -hmm. oh yeah i think like, that oh, go ahead garwin no sure like if you only have a single location that's there's no diversity anywhere it will get stale no matter how good you make everything in there like you don't even have to change the any uh, scenery or all that much even if you're in the city that doesn't have a lot of diversity if you make if you make diverse enough characters it can function yep but that mm -hmm. can also be more difficult than simply adding different streets with different flavor to them absolutely which will and, go a long way uh, and one example that's actually given here for locations of diversity is like uh the general economic uh livelihood of sections like such as like the upscale wealthy s section of town and the poor sum of town <laughs> well, absolutely and that's a really great example because yeah. uh um Let's say you're, some adventures do take place entirely in the city. Doesn't mean you can't be diverse, right? Nope. Um, and oh, those yeah. are good examples. We are doing, uh, we've been running through uh, Ravnica, which is one of the most diverse cities that you can think of because it's literally an entire planet <laughs> or yeah. plane, technically. Yeah. And no, so, Ravnica kind of cheats. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing, so I don't know about anybody else, but a lot of my old school games dealt with just delving into dungeons and fighting stuff in forests mm. and stuff in mountains. And that was pretty much it. Um, mm. And that wasn't nearly as unique as traveling to a different plane of existence. Right now in our plane shifters, yep. we went for Forgot Forgotten Realms to Ravnica. And, you know, delving into uh, the elemental plane of fire or mm. going into, I think in, uh, what was the the giant one we did? The Storm King's Thunder? Yeah. That took us yeah. in the high in the mountains. It took us into frozen tundras. It took us deep underwater into like an Atlantean type thing. And those were very, very interesting. Or, or cables with magma in them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that just made the game in more, mm. ex more engaging and fun than just constantly running through a typical dungeon and through the forest. Um, yeah. It definitely sounds like it would. The one thing people often make a mistake is that they think that in order to properly add flair, they have to go into the different planes, which you don't really need to. Like, just look at our world right now. It's quite simple. You go outside, go outside now, and then look at how people live in a desert. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned that. So in our extraordinary expeditions that just got funded, our Kickstarter, the ninth level Welcome. adventure takes place in a desert. And I focused a lot on the description on how the world is different from the other places, from having yeah. like uh, sand sleds, right, to get around. Yeah. And that's part of the diversity of a good diverse location is the way of everyday life of the creatures in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a really great question here that says... Uh, you need you uh, y'all said you need YouTube watchers for metrics and exposure, right? Or do you prefer Twitch? Definitely YouTube. If you're gonna mm -hmm. watch on a live stream, please watch on YouTube. That one drives more tra traffic than many many others. Yeah. So thank you for that. Good to know. So was there anything else you think that really needs to be included uh, when you're diversifying your locations? I think we can hit the nail on the head, and we have nine more tips to go. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, but because I never shut up, I got one more line to say. Diverse locations doesn't mean long travel. 
Um, mm. That's something that can easily get passed up. You can have yeah. one adventure that takes place in a forest, another one that takes place in a dreary, you know, dungeon temple underground, another one that takes place on a swamp, the top of a mountain, all that in yeah. a small yeah. area. I mean, shoot, one great example of that was over the weekend, I finally sat down and watched Arcane. And technically, the entire show takes place in one city. But there's the upper city, which is like very, where the wealthy live and is very well to do, and what mm-hmm. you'd expect from like a high fancy uh, magic punk area. Whereas there was the lower city, yeah. which is it's very just across the river. Swamp. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, see, I have I've got to watch that. That sounds really good. Oh yeah, they do that, do story pretty well. Yeah, that, that's what he was saying. He's like, they did it surprisingly well, so I'll have to check it out. I'm like, it's a show based on the League of Legends. My expectations were not high, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then just because most video game based shows don't aren't really that great, but this will make, this is good. I think Castlevania did really good. All right, so we're getting off topic. Uh, Diversity of locations is definitely the number one tip today. Number two is, I would say it kind of ties into it, but establish world flavor. Oh, yeah, that one's good. What that means is the tone of the world you're setting in. Um, You know, even if the campaign, you know, travels across the globe, there should be Mm. a constant theme or tone that kind of goes yeah. with it. a really great example of this is the the animation uh, avatar last airbender oh yeah uh, that has a tone that follows it no matter where you go the war that's going on with the fire nation is a tone of is the world flavors tone and setting theme mm-hmm. and it, no matter where they go even when they're having fun you know sliding on you know uh freaking seals or whatever down snowplow that's still something that's constantly hanging in the air oh yeah what do you think garwin well it's definitely something that's really necessary to keep in mind but something that the dm sometimes fail fail is to is to keep the overall flavor of the world a little flexible oh like, yes for, like for example i'm running on a grim hollow in the game on the every other weekend on mm-hmm. usually on this day with two newbies and one veteran of D and D, and then the, I started the, the Grimmauld session out. You know, it's gonna be horror filled, gonna be like all thriller and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then a the, two or three sessions in, I noticed that the you know newbies, being newbies, they weren't really all on the, into the money. My character, my characters might die. I need to get invested in this. They were more interested in goofing off in a bit. So I slowly, over the next couple of sessions, started switching the flavor of the entire campaign from gritty horror to more and a horror comedy interesting yep yeah. so that managed to you managed to kind of fit that in pretty well it seems yeah. yep. and they've actually had more fun since you know it actually plays into how they were kind of playing their characters that makes me think of the meme i saw one time where the campaign i was hoping for it's just like the starks from game of thrones mm-hmm. the campaign mm-hmm. i ended up with so it's like the cats of buffy Price on the holy grail <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I think yeah. that's pretty common yeah. but um so in this example they talk about you know the world in general not necessarily the tone of the adventure right so in this example yeah. they talk about dark souls you know a hopeless and bleak gothic mm-hmm. world can be that way and still have some fun on the side, oh, but yeah. the world has this kind of set tone. So having something that deviates from that is a good change to change mm-hmm. it up. So don't be afraid to do that. They also talk about, you know, how there's a difference between something like Dark Souls and Dragon Quest or mm-hmm. something, uh, Tales of Symphonia, all those settings, they're, they're brighter, they're lighter, they're less, they don't take themselves as serious as like Dark Souls or, or is it Sekiro? Sarek- Sarek- yes, um, Sekiro. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that's something that you should establish when designing your world uh, yeah. right away. Once again, as Garwin said, don't necessarily lock yourself into it. Being able to deviate is going to be a benefit, yeah. but make sure that that tone is there. And like how there's like, often different tones, even within like say sci-fi or steampunk, or yep. Yeah. Even though it's not mentioned here, magic punk. <laughs> yeah, like a good example for like an, a, a world's flavor shifting yeah. a little. It's like if you like, let's say you have like a grim. In a year, dark world, you know, like mm-hmm, the yeah. entire world is basically nothing but darkness because the sun's blocked out or something. A way you could like switch and you slowly transfer that into a more almost lighthearted but not completely to go with what your players kind of wish mm-hmm. is, for example, you can have the clouds occasionally part a little, like go from darkness to like maybe dim light. Uh-huh. And in, in the, instead of having the vampire aristocracy be always tyrants, they can be more like. Well, we live forever and we're vampires. Why would we need taxes? You just live as you wish. We just want your blood every now and again. You know, donate here and there. 
<laughs> I like the idea of him having like a donate station. You don't want us to kill you? Pile in and donate. <laughs> you yeah. can walk out and come back in a month. We want to um, take your money. <laughs> yeah. First question. What was what was the last meal you ate? <laughs> oh, this guy's eating pig. Jimmy, this is your flavor. <laughs> oh, it, Italian, come back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You don't hey, want garlic. <laughs> hey, Donnie, you like pineapples, right? This guy eats lots of fruit. Yeah. All right. So anyway, so uh, establishing world flavor. Wow, we really went off the edge there. Oh, yeah. um, so managing geography is the third point here. And this is something that I failed at early on. Um, in order to make a, a world feel real, you have to kind of sit around and set up, okay, where is everything going to be at and does it make sense? Especially when it yeah. comes to travel routes and visual re representations that the in-world characters can use. You know, mm -hmm. when it comes to traveling in like a fantasy setting, the merchants are rarely going to remember the names of... Um, all the different things that they can see, but they can point out the dragon spine mountain point or something, yeah. or the, the swamp of sorrows, you know, that mm. you pat, you drive three days from the swamp of sorrows. So yeah. coming up with a nice uh, grounded geography is important. You don't want a tundra right next to a desert. Typically things like that, just not only do they not make sense and, and though there are exceptions, there are exceptions. Uh, Magic is a thing, right? Oh yeah. Um, but you That's want a floating mountains. Yes, and water that falls the wrong direction. I'm a fan of yeah. that. Um, and so when you're you're managing your topography, there are some things that you want to make sure is consistent. Water runs mm -hmm. downhill, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so having a yeah. river that runs up a mountain, it, there should be a reason if that's you're going to do that. Yeah. There's a reason why their yeah. gravity's like broken any, or something. Like an, like an, if you're going to break the laws of physics, make it an exception that has a reason in universe. So that the players can find it and be uh -huh. invested, instead of just you know, because nice. if because if, if you only if you break the laws of physics just willy nilly and have no reason for it, then every time the player sees something strange, they'll go, eh, it's just one of those, and won't go investigate it. Yeah, um, absolutely, and that's that's a really nice point you touched on because it's different. It gives them a reason to want to go and learn about it yep. and uncover the lore. Um, so mountains and islands don't float. I wonder why they're floating over there. Let's go look. Is oh, going yeah. to be more interesting than if every mountain floats, I guess. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Maybe like, that's not the best like, analogy, but like I remember when on a friend of mine who was who runs a D and D session here also uh, on the every now and again, he made a map for a world. It was a it was a really silly world. It has lots of shenanigans and whatnot, but the map was you know it's pretty good. There was one section of the map that caught my interest immediately. Off the side and over the ocean a bit, there were just floating mountains there. I looked at that, looked at the rest of the map. Uh, okay, north ice, there's a volcano there, okay. A bit of lava. <laughs> there's desert, there's tundra, there's kind of foresty thing. Okay, kind of makes sense. I looked at the mountains, looked at there. That stands out. I want to go there. We never did, but I, to this day, I haven't forgotten about them. That's, I love that. You know that island there floating in the air? It has a, a waterfall coming off it. Where's the water come from? Wouldn't it run out and stop being a waterfall eventually? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's an awesome. Ooh, Darth Julio, he says, uh, this is really cool. You make them interesting so the players are smart enough to investigate rather than spend an hour breaking down why you randomly said a toad had yellow markings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, so uh, just when it comes to geography, just mm. make sure it has a semblance of logic. And when you do yeah. make exceptions, make sure there's a reason for the exception. Yeah. Now, yeah, a good tip to help get your players invested is to just make a map. And even if you cannot make a proper map, just go into paint, make a horrible map, and just outline the big things and go, this is here, this is there. And then just show it to the players. They don't even have to keep it. Just show it to them. This is the world. And if you don't want them to look at the horrible drawings more, take it away. <laughs> they got a glimpse. Now you can you do the rest you by just are. describing it so they know the outline. Now, I remember a post one time that said, one time in my campaign, I had the players travel back 200 years into the past, and at one point, I described a giant mountain off in the distance. But then the player's like, wait a second, that mountain wasn't there there before. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to it? And now uh, I have to figure out what happened to this mountain. Be the years. Mountains <laughs> yeah. uh, David Copperfield's visiting. All right, so let, we got to move on. Uh, so oh, number yeah. four, uh, don't show your full hand. I suck mm. at this. <laughs> I do too. I I get too excited. 
Why are you laughing, Ian? Just the way you said it. <laughs> yeah, don't show your full hand. So while it is important for the DM to kind of share maybe a map or something of the known world, it mm. doesn't mean that you can't have some surprises and secrets in store for the players. Yeah. When we talked about uh, hex crawls, that was one of my favorite parts of hex crawls is, okay, here's three main points that everyone knows about. Who the hell knows what's in all these other areas? Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, uh, part of that discovery is not only fun for the player, but also could be fun for the DM, especially if you're letting them in on the world building process. Yeah. Um, like, and I, I'm doing something like this in Grim Hollow. Like, I looked at the Grim Hollow map, and I always thought it, it, it was either way too small, or there were way too few settlements. Okay. Because, like, when you look at the kingdom, not like the Bore the kingdom of souls in darkness. What technical term? Yeah. The kingdom of souls in darkness. There's like nine settlements in there. I look at that and I just think, no, that's too little. So I changed it and basically had. The things that are marked, those are just cities and towns. Those are important places. Between there are villages and maybe smaller towns that no one cares to mark on a map. Right. That they can discover along the way. And Andrew actually has a good point on this. And I think we've talked about this during the hex crawl uh, episode where giving the maps with mistakes so the player characters oh, yeah. can actually fix and correct them and then maybe yeah. resell a correct map back to other people. <laughs> um, so that's really good. Just yeah. make sure you it's okay to keep secrets. Um, yeah. And having false information is another really great way to do that. Oh, yeah. You know, describing how the monsters live to the the big giant minotaur live in the mountain. And, you know, people don't go up there because of the big bad minotaur. And turns out it's not a big bad minotaur. It's some giants who are some uh, goliaths who wear like Viking like helmets and make them look like minotaurs. So everyone just leaves them alone. <laughs> Ceremonial. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot you can do with that. It says in this map of the village right here. Wait. Well, 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 yeah, and we went there, and there was no village there. Huh? That's weird. I mean, there's a giant smoking crater there. <laughs> there's no village there. Huh? There's not one now. <laughs> like another way you could do it is with a map that barely shows anything. Like it's a map that only shows like major cities and things that are like 50 miles wide or more, like a 50 mile forest or 50 mile desert. Sure, there might be forests all over the place, but the map isn't going to give out shit enough to actually mark them down. <laughs> For sure. Um, so, and, and what's interesting is uh, if Wheel of Time has taught me anything, mm -hmm. it's that uh, the people half the time don't actually know what's beyond their little areas. Um, yeah. And that's something I think that we assume in some yeah. cases with adventurers. Oh, an adventurer would know this. Well... Where did they learn that? Well, the library in your small village has got six books. So, oh, yeah. a traveling peddler. Well, now it could be a mistake. It could be an error. It could be wrong completely. Yeah. So, I mean, your average medieval peasant didn't really leave a five mile radius for the most part. So, right, for their entire <laughs> life, too. So, and another thing people forget maps are military assets. Yep. You never Ooh. get detailed maps because that is a military liability. Like, if you're in one kingdom, you get a map of the world. Not gonna show shit of other kingdoms. Yeah, barely <laughs> sure. anything of its own, especially if you manage to get it. Yeah. Yes. How how did you get a detailed map? Did you steal it from the from the royal armory? Oh snap! Although I did find it interesting you mentioned Wheel of Time because without going into the TV show, like hmm. we've all heard the phrase, "How does your character know what a troll is?" <laughs> and yep. so on and so forth. I'm like my rebel is usually. Well, in the Wheel of Time, the main characters grew up in a small, isolated farming village, but they still knew what a Trolloc was. <laughs> but they, most yeah. of them believed it didn't exist. But they yeah. still knew what it was. Yeah. So, to be fair, oh. that specific village was always emphasized to be as exceptionally isolated. Yeah. Right. Though <laughs> that rule still applies. Yes. All right. So we're going to move on because we're running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so provide wildlife. This is the single best tool for a game master or dungeon master to share the details of the world and how the area is diverse going back to point one how it yeah. is diverse you know when was the last time in your campaign you randomly described a, a black squirrel rock, rock, climbing up a tree black aren't they usually red well here they're black well why is that you know who knows i but, need to do more of that <laughs> i remember one time i was deer hiding like there's a red squirrel there's a gray squirrel there's a black squirrel <laughs> right yeah. i've never i've never been 
done anything like that because hunting is boring for me but that's why i like it there's nothing going <laughs> like on it? um so anyway so when it comes to like the fauna and the, the not just the the creatures themselves but also like the plants and stuff too you know yeah. if you've got somebody that's got a poisoner's kit or has a uh a herbalism kit maybe they in or just skilled in nature notice these different types of flowers yeah. you know yeah. Maybe and Danny also, like, you don't need to be proficient in anything related to nature. You could be a random city man that never stepped outside to notice that the purple flowers are weird. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's a great point, because if you're used to being in an area where everything is yellow and red, and all of a sudden and now it's purple and yeah. blue, um, that's going to be noticeable. And it makes your world feel diverse. The same yeah. thing goes for, like, mountains. Mountains can be made of different types of rocks. Yep. So maybe usually it's limestone, but now it's sandstone, you know, and they notice yeah. it's different. Is it going to function any per, have any functional purpose? Probably not. But it makes your world feel more different and alive. Like you don't um, even have to think of a name for it, for any of this stuff yourself. Just say the colors. And if they ask, uh, gibber something and say that's the name. Ooh, uh, Darth Juyo, Juyo, Juyo uh, says something that I've touched on many times and I cannot recommend enough. He briefly uh, talked about, you know, if they're near a forest or something, spotting a, um, a uh, pegasus or something flying in the distance. Little things like that bring your world to life, um, yeah. whether it's fauna or celestial beings or demons and devils fighting in the sky in the distance. Doesn't have to inv involve the players, but being aware, well, why is there demons and devils? Well, I heard that there's, you know, Doom Mountain that has a portal to the, you know, Nine Hells somewhere nearby or some shit. Yeah. Yep. Dude, I just walked to the countryside of my way over and saw a massive red giant fight a great giant. Oh, those two again. <laughs> <laughs> They're back at it again. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, so, uh, Andrew actually has a really good point here. If you don't know how to make your own time, grab a board game pieces and assign village and cities and natures and features and whatever the various game pieces, scatter them across the man randomly. I love that. Uh, the next thing you want to do is you want to develop point six is develop a history. Honestly, this is more difficult than it sounds. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you can make a few things consistent by answering a yep. few of your own questions, such as what type of kingdom is in here right what type of uh what is the 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 standard you know trade is it does this area deal with you know uh taba tobacco tobacco whatever mm. tobacco or do they do deal in wheat or are they all leather workers and when you start answering simple questions like that it yeah. automatically starts to spew diarrhea of the mouth of all yeah. the different things that are then going to be tied to it or even just a random name drop of something can invoke, like uh, some imagery. Oh, yeah, I remember years ago during the Steel Wars. Wait, what? <laughs> what the hell's a yeah. Steel War? And then you can go <laughs> off from there. Yeah. Like, well, there's one thing that Dungeon Masters sometimes run into, though. When they make it develop a history of the world, they make details so much in the past that no one today has a reason to properly know that they end up with so, yes. so much stuff that they can't find anything in it. Which is why I often recommend, instead of developing the entire history, develop things that the people would know and things that are likely to come up or random facts that you might want to bring up. Like, I actually, when I read this one, what came to mind was, I remember years ago I read a crash article of uh, fan theories that were about the, the original source material. <laughs> and mm. one of them was, what fans came up with was what the Clone Wars were, and mind you, this was when we only had the original trilogy. Uh -huh. mm. Like, okay, here's what we knew about the Clone Wars. It was a war. Fought with clones. That's yeah. all we knew. <laughs> but it sounded pretty awesome. Yeah, so but, you can oh, yeah. some ideas. Right, and the popular fan theory was, like, like we all knew like that Jedi were, were awesome warriors. And like, hey, you might as well clone the awesome guys. And Obi, but, and people for the longest time thought his name was Obi-Wan Kenobi. Which sounds like a serial number. <laughs> so like maybe maybe Ben Kenobi was actually a clone, and Obi Wan was a serial number, and Kenobi was a template he was based off of. Oh, oh shit, no. that is way cooler than the actual stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like I will admit, I was a bit kind of uh, disappointed in the Clone Wars because it only lasted three years. Yeah. Um, the Clone Wars two show was awesome. So, uh, uh, oh, we yeah, do have a good course. question from Dark. Before I get into that, I think a recent history is great. Final Fantasy fourteen did this really good with the breaking mm. of the world at the start of the game. 
it's very oh, recent yeah. in like 10, 10 years. So that's a good yeah. way to do it. Yep. Darth says, okay, I do have a question on making things feel real. Do you have or use moving battles in the narrative? Like maybe they talk about the king, but make him angry and now they have to fight their way out. So and it starts in the throne room or meeting room and moves to the halls, then the walls or the courtyard opening the door. Yeah. Um, yeah. That would be a, a fantastic way to make a battle feel real because yeah. no battle stands still. No. Um, but oh, those yeah. are, those can be difficult to pull off in some cases. Yeah. I think like when, for it, me, like when it comes to those, I think a preference would to be to make it like not an actual, on the year, a down and dusty D and D map, or even a theater of the mind map, and have actual f and a fighting mechanics, and make it more a skill challenge to try and escape. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Maybe, or you could even go a hybrid of the two, where oh, you have yeah. battle combat, and then there's a skill challenge to get to the next flight up or down, and then yeah. it leads to another combat and another set of skill challenges. A good way to do that. And the, uh, yeah. Okay, I tried to escape by cutting the rope, jump the chandelier, and carry me up. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you're the one. Oh, what's that mean? The chandelier falls on you instead. Because <laughs> you cut the wrong rope. I cut the oh right rope. All right. So uh, number uh, seven tip is subvert expected tropes. I'm a big fan of this because um, this helps me as a DM to hmm. break up the more negative sides of uh, uh, metagaming. But yeah. subverting tropes like uh, pulling from things people have seen a bunch of. Lord of the Rings. Avoid <laughs> stuff that happens in that because everyone's already familiar with it, for instance. Oh, so I, yeah. Well, I'll get mixed feelings in this one because I see this one more, more of a balancing act because, yeah, I get the idea of uh, avoiding the tropes to keep things interesting, but at the same time, we kind of like the tropes, so... Yeah, okay. like, they became tropes for a reason. Yeah. Right, and that's true, and we've talked about that before, but this is, gives us a really good example yeah. of why I think it's a good way to do it. So I, I would say change just enough to keep things interesting, but... <laughs> that's why I think you'll like this yeah. one. So in the example, it says, you know, orcs, uh, uh, for example, the orcs of one's world could still be war-hungry and violent, but rather than savage brutes, they're calculating tacticians. That, Ooh. to me, I know is tickling uh, Garwin's dice right now. Um, oh, yeah. But that's a really great way to subvert the, the brutish yep. uh, trope that they are, but still keep them as power-hungry, uh, you know, warlords. So Yeah. Like, I did something similar in a recent campaign of mine. Like, in a, a town was being besieged by orcs. And the orcs had mammoths with trebuchets on them and were using battle strategy in the in the in the get in in the field and my players were confused as all hell about what the fuck was going on <laughs> <laughs> sounds awesome i love yeah. that um so number eight is play to the party's interest no matter what yep. rpg you're playing you need to be doing this yeah oh yeah. that is in my opinion this is justin's opinion and it sounds like these two might agree that part of the game is engaging the players and the best way to do yeah. that is to pull stuff from what they've written and from their characters and include it. Yeah. Um, mm. A really good example of this is on the rogue, uh, the the default uh, printed rogue, the uh, the mm. pre the pre generated one. It has yeah. a little story about how the red brands, you know, and something with your family member or something. So mm. that gives the DM, oh, I can go take these red bands since they're part of their backstory, and now I've kidnapped his aunt or something because this yeah. person to be in the red brands those are the things that interest people yeah. so you want to keep those in your world and come oh, the yeah. same pain i think it's good to make sure that your place has always have something to do to keep them engaged yeah like i yeah. had a dm who one time com complained about how well it's not not my job to keep keep you guys interested you have to find stuff to do and i'm saying going we're playing a star trek rpg the mission was a bio biological science mission on the planet and i'm the ship pilot <laughs> what am i gonna do <laughs> and, and yeah. it goes it goes even farther than that too so uh, one of the examples that they give that I really, really like is they talk about if you've got a party full of people who like lore and role playing the mm. the dip, uh, the diplomacy aspect of the game, mm. they're highly they're going to be significantly less likely to be interested in becoming you know top tier gladiators. So yeah. why don't force them into don't set a setting where they're to become the the top tier gladiator? That's probably not something they're interested in, but yeah. they'll still probably play with you because they love D and T. But you know, no, there is. <laughs> thing i will say about this make be careful not to make every single thing just the stuff you know they're interested in and nothing yeah, that's else true. you do got to add some variety i agree like um, occasionally on purpose make something you know your players don't like and 
see if they go for it or not. Because if uh, they so go, you're saying maybe if you deliver it, even though you think they might not like it, that they might. Yeah, so kind even, of and even if they don't like it, it, yes, and even if they don't like it, it will still then make the stuff they do like look better. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I like that. Um, but so, you gotta be careful not to do, do too much of that. Yeah, you don't yeah. you don't want to have everyone all. How was your how was your game? Ah, it sucked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nah, but there'll be a long branch if I go into that. Anyway. <laughs> awesome. I appreciate that. I wish I had that sort of willpower. So number nine is prepare for your party to go anywhere. This oh, is something yeah. that – so when I played fourth edition and third edition and all that stuff, I always wrote these really complex stories and mm. didn't realize I was funneling my players towards them because I put all this effort into them. Yeah. You can put all the time and effort you want into planning, but as soon as you take away their choice, yeah. you're actually inhibiting them unless unless they are okay with being on a railroad. And some people are, and that's yeah. okay. Like yep. in a year. The good way to do that, even if you do, like I say, you're running a module. Many people yeah. complain that when you're running a module, you have to go through these things and you can't really deviate. What I'm doing right now with my campaign is pretty good example of you can't properly deviate. Like, for example, I'm running on the uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen, and we're currently in the travel section, and we're in near the end of it, where they're supposed to get to the Mars. But on the, uh, my players instead got distracted by the by the siege of that town by a bunch of orcs and an undead horde that came, and they went, what the fuck is that? <laughs> went right past that, allowed the, the caravan with the cultists to get past them, because they knew they could get to the town first, before mm -hmm. them. Right. And went into this dungeon that we've been spending the last three or four sessions in. Wow. Yeah. Trying that's to figure cool. out where these undead are coming from. And eventually yeah. they'll come out and go after the cultists again. And but and that's also the benefit of being prepared for your party to go anywhere. Because yeah. that also extends to you what they're interested in. Yeah. Um, and that to me is one of the the hands down the important aspects. And Because I, I used to be the other person. Yep. Be like, oh you bastards! You're going the wrong direction! Yep. There's nothing over there! There's nothing over there! Yep. Well... Why isn't there anything over there, Justin? And I'll admit, in the game that I ran too, I asked because when I, I ran Prince of the Apocalypse, the problem was the it was meant to be very sandboxy, but the problem was, mm -hmm. okay, it's so sandboxy. How do I get the players to even go anywhere? Yeah. And the players would say, you know what? If it keeps the game moving, I don't mind a, a light r r railroad. And that's a really great <laughs> yeah. segue into Darth's uh, uh, comment here. Linear storytelling is okay. A railroad where you basically take away all agency is not. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I agree with that. And that's a, that's a very subtle difference, but often gets masked kind of together. Yep. Um, yeah. So in, so the last uh, tip on this list is allow events to unfold with or without characters. In my opinion, mm -hmm. in Justin's opinion, this is the single best world building tip. Because oh, yeah. in order for the world to feel real, it has to unfold. Things have to be going on regardless of what the characters are doing. Yeah. Um, a really like good example. Go ahead. Yeah. Like it's the uh, effect of the just normal RPG. Like let's say Skyrim, for example. Like people play Skyrim still to this day, but you constantly see people complain about like you become leader of every single guild in Skyrim and no one reacts to it at all. Right. And you <laughs> you ignore the end quest line all the time for like fifty years in game, nothing happens. Yep. It allows them to just do whatever and many people quit along the way. Yeah. Yep. Like one example I can see is let's say the adventure scene on a job board, someone under attack. A call to arms was put out, mm -hmm. and the players mm -hmm. decided not to take the job because they had something else going on. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then, two, three sessions later, you saw see refugees <clears throat> come in from the settlement, yeah, because yeah. they didn't protect it. <laughs> so that's a really good example. The one one event that I did where I really took this to heart was I had set out three destructive um, options for the mm -hmm. players, and one of them was there's a lot of trumbling and shaking. Uh, on the ground of the earthquake. Well, the players weren't super interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. So they end up taking another hook. And then when they tried to come back to this village, it was gone because the volcano erupted and destroyed everything. And they're yeah. like, where did, where'd it go? It's like, remember that trembling? The, you know, they were through NPCs. Remember that trembling? The mountain blew its top and destroyed everything. And since you didn't investigate it, nobody was there to yeah. uh, warn them. Or you could go another far. I didn't think about going this way. Having another adventuring group go to investigate it and then fail 
for some reason and the place still blow up. But that makes the world real because it's altering over time due to yeah. either inaction or failed action on the parties, uh, yeah. on the players. Uh, like part. Anaya, another thing with the quest board that Anaya, my players actually did take, but I had it planned what would happen if they didn't. There were there were three things, but one of them was just about a bandit, so I'm just going to ignore that. Mm-hmm. They took two things. One of them was an, a, a a request for it was for help to help settling a marriage dispute, and the reward was 500 gold, Jeez. which was a lot. It does sound like a lot. Yeah. Another was an, a, a request to help subjugate a giant on the road. Now, because the, an, the giant on the road was on the way, they, yeah, they didn't know what the fuck was to deal with the giant. They went to the marriage dispute first. And they went there, found a, a found a brass dragon couple bickering. Oh! <laughs> yeah. And the it. reason they were bickering was because there were a bunch of eggshells on the ground, and a red dragon wormling had come out. Oh! <laughs> you been cheating on me? <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and the best part was. The wife couldn't say whether she cheated or was forced because of pride. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we do not condone uh, anything no. described in that. Um, yeah. Not at all. Is, Which uh, is why I ignored that completely yeah. and just, you know, went with things. But <laughs> one on. of the things that would have happened had they, for example, not taken care of the hill giant later, who thought he was invisible but wasn't. Mm-hmm. Was that oh, the, yeah. <laughs> Yep. That's like that uh, mystery men scene yep. where he's like, nobody looks at me, I'm invisible. Well, yeah. Okay. Like he literally just had a pie on the road and just a club just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, All well, right. Think... Over... Yeah. yeah. Overall, these are some pretty amazing tips. Obviously, we, we yeah. have our own thoughts on some of them, but um, it's a really great article as well. These are things that can totally take you from a new level, new. Uh, a new DM to a masterful uh, storyteller because yeah. when the world evolves and is interesting and intriguing and want the player characters want to investigate and mm. poke, poke around, ask questions, that's when you've really succeeded at telling a, yeah. uh, not just a great story, but building a living, breathing oh, world. Yeah. So, uh, okay. all right, we're already behind quite a bit. So I think that'll do yeah. it for our main topic. Before we move on to our unearth tips and tricks, we have a to take a moment to give a huge shout out to our sponsor, Manscaped. Ho, 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 gentlemen. The holidays came early here at Grid Academy. Thanks to our generous sponsors at Manscaped. Who is the best in the men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world? Join over 4 million worldwide who trust in Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with code CRIT at manscaped.com. Jingle balls to the walls, fellas. Listen up. Manscaped has provided us with the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 so we could share with you how awesome it is. (laughs) Inside the Performance Package 4.0, you'll find the signature Lawn Mower 4.0. This electric trimmer has proprietary advanced skin-safe technology to reduce cuts on your nuts. I'm pretty sure we all will kind of appreciate that quite a bit. And Uh it's also waterproof, so you can use it in the shower. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Crop Preserver and the Crop Reviver, which feel great, by the way, an anti-chafing ball deodorant, moisturizer, and toner to keep your North Pole feeling and smelling fresh. The ladies will love it, or your spouse will love it, or your partner. This hygiene bundle will also come with a pair of Manscaped anti-chafing boxers, which are so comfortable that they'll keep your junk feeling fresh all day. The perfect package for to protect your perfect package. Tis the season to load up on Manscaped products. So get yourself, your dad, that'd be kind of weird, your brother and friends <laughs> that gets a smooth dice this holiday season. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. So, uh, Ian, you, uh, so we've all had our, 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 um, experiences with these. Brandon's got an amazing, uh, uh, unboxing that's going to drop at some point. You're going to love it. But, uh, so I always struggle with the different, you know, I don't like to lose my dice, so to speak. So I've experienced, you know, with all the different tools and 
when I picked up the the lawnmower, I was literally blown away. <laughs> okay, probably poor choice of words. Yeah, thank you. Um, but I was really surprised at how clean and cut, uh, nice and cut it was. Um, I was super impressed with the fact that I didn't nick myself at all, which is very um, all too common. Yep. Um, I end up bloodied. <laughs> well, I'll admit, as a single guy, this is a topic that I really thought about in a while. And uh, and I'll admit, I don't like the idea of like uh, putting a uh, razor blade anywhere near my uh, family jewels. Yeah. <laughs> I want to keep those dice nice and clean. Right. But a pair of clippers, which is kind of what this is, it's definitely a huge step up in that regard. And you want to sweat as much, oh, if you will. Yeah. Roll a nat 20 this holiday giving uh, gift giving season and get 20% off and free shipping with code CRIT at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with your free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code CRIT. Clean up your dice and satchel and make Santa proud this year. And have yourself a smooth bag of holding. Yes, yes. <laughs>